this month we are believing God for household salvations. Household salvations. Um, we've spoken um, very much, well, there's still much to be talked about, about uh, miracles in general. We've said that we are um, believing God and that as we, uh, we pursue the miraculous, we, we speak about uh, his healing power, his healing grace, the power of Christ, which is still at work in us as believers today. Um, one of the things that we don't want to lose sight of is the greatest miracle, which is the miracle of salvation. And my, my heart is that each and every one of us will experience this personally and you experience this in your home. Um, and I, I, want you, I, I want to entrust unto you um, a responsibility. Pray for your families. Pray for your family members. Pray for your friends. Anybody, you have friends who are not saved? You have family members who are not saved? Anybody here? You, you, oh. If, you, if the, all your family members are saved, praise God. I'm sure there are people in your community who are not saved. But if there are people you know, listen, it's our responsibility to pray them into salvation. Amen? All right, so that's your responsibility. Okay? And we are going to share that burden together. Because we are praying for you, we are praying for your families, but let's all pray together. All right, so this morning... By God's grace, we, we're going to go into the Word again. Turn with me to John chapter 9. Read a bit of Scripture. Uh, we've been in the book of John, just focusing on the miracles that John highlighted in his, in his gospel. Uh, today, we are reading from John chapter 9, from the verse 1 to the verse 19. In fact, it's the whole chapter that's under consideration, but it's quite a long one, so we can't look at all the verses um, However, we'll take these ones. So, my Bible says, Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned that this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the work of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he has said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with saliva. And he anointed the eyes of the, man, of the blind man with the clay, and he said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Therefore, the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, It's not this he who sat and begged. Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. He said, I am he. Therefore, they said to him, How were your eyes open? He answered and said, A man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and I received sight. Then they said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought him who formerly was blind to the Pharisees. Now it was a Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also asked him again how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put clay on my eyes, I, I washed, and I see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such things? There was a division amongst them. They said to the blind man again, what do you say about him because he opened your eyes? He said, he is a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him who had received his sight. And they asked them, saying, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? So we're going to skip all the way to the verse 35. 
I'll encourage you to read the rest of it when you, you get back. Um, it says, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. Then he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may be made blind. Then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, Are we blind also? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now that you say we see, therefore your sin remains. The Lord bless the reading of his word. I'm speaking to you this morning on Jesus, the cure for every form of blindness. It is difficult to have a medical condition from birth. Some of us know what this means or what this feels like. But many of us don't. However, she shared her story with me of how the very first time she wore glasses, she felt cheated. I said, wow, because the images apparently uh, were sharper. And she didn't know, realize the whole time that that was actually how you were supposed to see. Many people have experienced what this blind man experienced. Having some kind of ailment right from the time that they, they've been conscious. But this morning, my encouragement to each and every one of us is that the Lord Jesus heals. He is in the business of healing whatever is supposed to define your life. When the Lord steps in, he is able to change those circumstances. I, I want you to do something. I want to make you a little bit uncomfortable this morning. So just pay attention and, and close your eyes for a, a moment. Humor me. Close your eyes for a moment. And I ask you... Close your eyes. The darkness that you see, the darkness that you experience right now, this would have been this man's reality for the rest of his life. His parents said that he was of age, which means he was probably over 20 years old. And so for already all these number of years, he had never seen the colors of the rainbow. He had never seen the beauty of the skies. Even as a baby, he had never had the opportunity to look in the loving face of his mother as she breastfed him. Total darkness, physical darkness. This was going to be the situation until he entered the grave. You may open your eyes. It was for a moment, but it was uncomfortable. Jesus is the healer of blindness. Physical blindness. You know, even today, it is very difficult. Like... Medically, it is impossible still. It is still impossible for blind eyes to see. Medically. With all the advancement in technology, it's still not been possible. And so, the, the power of the miracle that Jesus displayed on that day is not something that is to be play, underplayed. He said... That from the beginning of time, that's what the scripture says there, the blind man said, 
We've never heard that anybody's eyes have ever been opened. In fact, this was one of the miracles that they were waiting, according to Isaiah, that when the, 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 the prophet would come, when the Messiah would come, that he would open up the eyes of the blind. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me to proclaim the gospel, to proclaim recovery of sight to the blind. And so they knew that it was only the Messiah who, when he shows up in town, the eyes of the blind will be open. And as they walked past this man, the disciples asked the question, Lord, who caused this? Because it, for them, it's like, no, surely. Like, why, why would you be born blind. You must, you must, your parents must have done something. There's something going on in the family. And now the question is, can a deformity, can ailments, can sickness come as a result of sin? Yes. And, and let me give you an example. because we, uh, This is quite familiar to most of you. First of all, the biblical example in John 5, which we've considered already. In John 5, the, the Lord Jesus healed the man at the pool of Bethesda. And after he healed him, he said to him that go and sin no more, lest something worse befalls you. So you can understand from the scripture that uh, there was something that this man was about that brought an affliction on him. It's not a popular idea, but according to the scripture, it's true. And even in our African context... There are families where an ancestor goes to a certain shrine or a certain, you know, goes for powers. And some of them, it is good intent. Sometimes some will say, oh, so that their families will be blessed, so that they will have a good harvest. And, and the, some of the conditions are that, okay, well, you, we are going to give you wealth, but uh, we, we're... Your, your, your women, uh, we, the, the, to activate this power, we're going to put a, an embargo on the womb. That's an extreme case, but it does happen. Not so. It's not, it's not a strange story. And so you see in families like this that women struggle to give birth. Until the light of the gospel comes in and then there is deliverance. This is who Jesus is. So it is possible for, for an affliction to set in by reason of sin. But Jesus said to them, no, friends, don't have that mentality every time you see such a, such a situation. It's not always the case. And in this particular case, what he was saying to them was that this one was set apart that God's glory will be made manifest. That there's, before time began, God had ordained that he was going to put this man here and he's going to receive his healing and God will receive the glory. And again, it's something that might make our theology, it might mess up with your, your theology a little, a little bit, your understanding of who God is a little bit. That God will put somebody there so that his name will be glorified. Everything on this earth, your life, my life, all of creation is for the glory of God. Everything must give God glory. In fact, many times when Jesus will approach people to heal them, he would ask them, what would you want me to do for you? That's the case of Bartimaeus, right? Another blind man. And he asked him, what would you want that I do for you? Because he's not going to assume that you want healing, that you want to see. But I found it interesting that as I, I consider this passage, Jesus did not ask him. <laughs> Jesus did not ask him, do you want me to heal you? After he had had that dialogue with his disciples, he just approaches the man and spat in the, in the earth and just began to do his thing. Why? Because that man, his life was not his. The condition that he was carrying was going to be for the glory of God. The, the Lord had positioned that in the timeline of Jesus, that they will meet and his life will be transformed. His eyes will be opened. He will see the glory of God and God will be manifested in the nation of Israel. And all men will say, have you heard what God has done? Can I propose to you that there's something 
in your life. That maybe you're not even praying to God for. <laughs> or maybe you've been crying out, you've been praying, God, if only I'll see a transformation. If only I'll experience change. And maybe you've been crying, it's been a year, it's been two, it's been three, it's been four, five years. You're wondering, God, when? But you see, there is what will give God glory and there's a time when that glory will be made manifest. Because one of the things about Jesus, I, I wonder, I wonder, just, just wondering that, was that the first time that Jesus was passing by that place? Was that the first time that he was going through that community? No! In fact, many people knew of him. Now, when you read Acts chapter 10, verse 38, it says that how God anointed Jesus with the Holy Ghost, and with power, and he went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed by the devil, and he was even healing everybody who was sick, right? Then you read also in Matthew, the same account, that Jesus was healing people, he was healing people. So you ask, what? Let me, let me push this a little further. In Acts chapter 3, there was a man who was said to sit at the gate, beautiful. That's the gate at the temple. Okay? And it was Peter and John who came to heal him. So you're asking, if Jesus was healing everybody, how come he didn't heal this man in Acts chapter 3? Because it's not just about the healing. It's that there's a time when, when the healing comes through, God is glorified. And I want to encourage you, listen, no matter what the issue is, no matter what the problem is, there is a time when that issue will bow and give glory to God. It must give glory to God. It must give glory to God. And so, don't stop praying. Don't stop believing. It might, uh, it might, it might seem like every, everything is closing up on you. There is no hope. Sometimes you can't see either in front of you, to the side, to the left. But don't stop believing. Keep crying out to the Lord. Jesus' solution for this man is to, is to spit. I, again, I wonder. You know, that's how I, I, I read the scriptures. My mind begins to, to run and, and to imagine. As I'm wondering, what is he doing here? Does it sound familiar that he puts his hand in the sand and then he puts it on the man's eyes? And I can't help but think of Genesis 1 when we are informed that God created a man. And I think what Jesus is, is demonstrating here is that, listen, what I've done before, I can do again. The same way that I created uh, everything uh, that, that is in this universe, in the same way that I formed the man, I am the same one who formed your eyes and I can form them again. The reason why we believe in the power of Christ to heal, to restore, is because Jesus is the one who has created, who has formed you. There is no part of your body that cannot be healed. There is no, I'm telling you, medical science has not found a cure to blindness from birth. But Jesus, he's healed. He does it even today. Many miracles and testimonies all across the nations. I was sharing with you about a book um, by one of the great theologians of our time, um, Dr. Craig Keener. Uh, miracles, if you can get a hand, uh, your hand on this book. It will bless you. He, he shares miracles from all over the world. Strange miracles. And this man is an intellectual. I mean, when he, the book he wrote is actually thousands of pages. And this one, he's, he's written for the average man, which is, I was saying that is over 200 pages. You can, you can see, he wrote it when he, during COVID in his basement. Like, these are not stories. These are real life. He's going to be at a world conference, by the way. You're going to hear like real life stories of people that Jesus has done incredible things, sometimes creative miracles. Why? Because he's the same person who went into the earth and created. No matter what the situation is, all, every due respect to the medical field. And the Lord many times will heal, use, you, use doctors to heal you. Don't despise the prescription. Don't despise the hospital. No. The wisdom that they carry, the understanding is given by God. It is for our benefit. But don't stay with the final analysis or the final diagnosis. Wait for that report. Whose report have we believed in? It's his report that we are waiting on and that we're waiting for. 
And he sends him to the pool of Salom. Salom means sent or the sent one. So what, <laughs> what Jesus is doing, he, he sends him. Like that pool carries his name, basically. So he sends him to be washed in him and to be cleansed in him. He's perfecting that miracle. Now, many of us would love for God to do something amazing in our lives. But if I should ask you, to what extent are you willing to go to experience the miraculous? This man was there. You know, I'm sure it wasn't the first time he had heard people speak about him. And that very day, he might have started to hear uh, these people again. Because Jesus was having a conversation with his disciples as they were passing. It's like, ah, uh, these guys again. Every time when people are passing, they were pointing to him and said, this man, you know his story? He's very sin, though. There's sin in the family. That's why he's, he's been blind from his bed. And so probably he's, he was overhearing, even if he didn't hear the conversation, maybe he hears people talking. It's like, ah, here we go again. Here we go again. They're not going to drop anything in my bowl. They're not going to give me money. They'll just be gossip, gossiping about me. But that day, something different happened. And as Jesus approached him, he does not hear anything. The next thing he hears, and spits mud on his eyes. We want a miracle. But sometimes are you willing to go down the road with Jesus? He does not even get healed immediately. He sends him to go wash. How far are you going, willing to go in that journey with the Lord? In pursuing and going and further and crying out to him and saying, Lord, I'm still believing you for this. I'm still holding on to your word. He had to walk all the way. With the mud and the spit all over his face. Today we want miracles, but we want it in a very nice way. We want it in a, very, in a way that suits us. When we want it at the time that we want it. 20 years he'd been carrying it. He had to walk a distance to go for the miracle. Friend, listen. Whatever the Lord has said to you, whatever is here in his word, his promises to us as believers, you can hold him to it. And don't relent. There's a man by name, Naaman in the, in the book of 2 Kings. Who the prophet Elisha gave him a command to go wash in the Jordan. So he could receive healing because he was sick from leprosy. This was an army general. In the same way he had an issue with it. That I did not... Be, you know, better rivers where I'm coming from. But at the end of the day, in obedience, he experiences miracle. As you, you pursue healing, pursue the miracles. Pay attention to the voice of God. No matter what he tells you, do it. Don't look around. Don't look at anybody. Focus on him. Sometimes illness ailment can bring about economic problems. This man had become a beggar. But begging was not the issue. The real issue was his eyesight. So for you and I as believers, as we administer the gospel, we proclaim the gospel, let, let us aim to go to the root of the problem. That's how Jesus deals with people. He goes to the because when he deals with that issue at the root, you'll be sorted out for life. He does not drop money. And could he have given him, given him money? Yes. Someone might have looked at Jesus and said, this man, people contribute to his ministry. Look at all the people following him. But he dealt with the right problem. The heart of the problem. And even more important, as we will see later on, he opens up his eyes so he believes in him. Healing is great. Healing is good. That's what it will do. That's what it will bring. But the most important part is that people's hearts are actually open to receive Jesus as their Lord and personal Savior. So he does not just heal the physical ailment, but then he gives him the greatest gift. I'm getting ahead of myself now. All right. So that's Jesus, the healer of physical blindness. 
the healer of blindness to the times and to the world. That's the second kind of blindness that we see. He says to his disciples that I must work the work of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. I want you to say to someone, night time is coming. Are you working? Are you about the business of God? Oh friend, night time is coming. Night time is coming. Jesus says, night. there is a time coming in your life where you will not have the opportunities that you have now. What, what is your life about? What is your primary occupation? What is your primary business? What have you filled your time with? His, his people who he was with, he was saying to them, Listen, as long as I am in the world, I'm the light of this world. And today you ask a question, darkness has covered the earth, as the prophet Isaiah prophesied, gross darkness upon the peoples. Is there light in this world? Yes, because he goes on to say, arise, shine for thy light has come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. There is light in this world because the glory of the Lord is risen upon us as a church, as believers, as children of God. We are the light of this world. The light of Christ is still here on this earth. But darkness prevails. How will people see if God's people will wake up and be about his business? Not about your own business. Not your will, but his will be done. What have you filled your time with? We go in and out, day in, day out. We are busy bodies. We are trying to make ends meet. We are, some of us are trying to be successful. Some of us are trying to be great. Some of us are trying to be famous. Jesus said, you better be doing my work. Because night time is coming. The, the, the writer, the preacher in Ecclesiastes says, there's no, <laughs> there's no life. There are no dreams in, in the grave where you are going. There's coming a time when that, that thing will be, the, your eyes will close forever. When you wake up, you either wake up to his glorious light. And I, my prayer is that everybody here as a child of God will wake up to that beauty, that glorious light. But by that time it will be over. By that time it will be an account that you render for your work. How did you spend your time? Go me to Ephesians chapter 5. Let's read from the verse 8. Very quickly. Oh, we must work the works of God. Just, for you were once darkness. Paul even takes it further. It's not only that you, you, you experienced darkness or you were blind. It's, you, we, we were actually once, we were darkness. Because our father, uh, the devil, is the, that, that um, frig, figure of darkness. Or who were after him, we were once darkness. But praise God, we are now children of light. Hallelujah. Amen. Says, but now you are light in the Lord. Someone say, I'm light in the Lord. You are a luminary being. You're supposed to shine in the dark. Your light must shine. People must see the glory of God in you. How are the blind of this world going to see? How are those who have never experienced the love of God, the peace of God, the joy of God? How would they do that? You shine your light. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3, he says that if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those whose eyes have been blinded. By the God of this world. There are people who are blinded to his goodness. So that they can never see unless you shine. Arise friend. Wake up. Night time is coming. When no one can work. Night time is coming. When no one can work. These are the, the, the highlight. The, the, <laughs> the high points of your, of your life. Or of your years. Many of us here. We are still very strong. You still have energy in your body. You can still move. You can still climb upstairs effortlessly. These are the light moments where people must experience. It says, walk as children of light. Walk as the children of light. Don't diminish your darkness. 
don't stay with the, the personal, uh, th- those, those personal sins. If you read the preceding verses, you see he lists, he makes a, a list of them. Don't, don't, still, don't stay in that place where you're still dabbling with things. Part of the reason that people are still struggling with, you know, just experiencing God is that those of us who have his light, his peace, we are still holding back. The whole world, the whole of creation is waiting for your manifestation. And the other day I asked you, the creation has been waiting since beginning of time. The creation has been waiting since the, the, uh, since the fall. The creation has been waiting since Paul wrote those very words in Romans chapter 8. How long will the creation wait for your manifestation? How long will creation, how long will your family wait until you, 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 you shed off that shyness? Until you stop saying, oh, I, I, am, I am shy. Oh, I, I cannot speak about Jesus. How long would the people in your community have to wait till you rise up and begin to shine that they may see the light of God? How long will creation have to wait? How long will the creation have to groan? How long will the people in your office have to wait for you to begin to shine? How long will the people in your family, how long will your friends have to wait for you to begin to shine? Arise, shine, for thy light has come. Night time is coming. Where no one can work. Nighttime is coming. And it's not just coming in your life. It's coming in the lives of many. There are people you hear of their journeys and their testimonies. And you are looking at them go up, go in and go out. Day in, day out. They are going and they are, you are watching them. And sometimes you have a question, a pressing in your heart. That this man know God. That this, this lady who is serving me, this waiter. Does he know God? That this waitress know God? And you are looking at them. And one day you come in and you hear they are no more. You enter the shop and as you enter, you see an obituary at the door. And that person who was serving you, day in, day out, and you are looking at them and you are asking, is this man saved as he know God? You come in and one day his obituary is up and he's gone. The night has caught up with him. Arise, shine, for the light has come. Years back, I was, we were, were still out of the country then and in the, in the complex that we were living in. There was a young man. He lived right up a building. And every time I would look at this man and, and we would say hi and I would say hi. Sometimes I would even go out to, you know, evangelize because I was doing that. And it would just... You know, this impression in my heart, ah, one day I should just engage him, go beyond the hello, hi, and just engage him in conversation. And then preach the gospel to him. I was like, oh. Another day. Another day. And then he, his girlfriend would come around, and very lovely young couple. It's like, ah, they should just get married. One morning, a very strange sight. Had some you know, footsteps, but it, it seemed more than the usual. You could actually tell that there were a lot of people around. I was like, wonder what's going on outside. Opened the window and I could see the light of an ambulance. Then the police. I said, hey, what's going on here? Has a crime been committed? Long story short, this young man had hanged himself sometime in the middle of the night. His girlfriend had been trying to reach him, came and found the body hanging right on top of me. It broke me. Nighttime is coming when no one can work. I, 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 I want to see the miraculous happen. I want to see the dead raised to life. I want to see the lame walk. I want to see blind eyes open. But the greatest miracle I want to to experience and I have a joy experiencing is is when people come to the faith. When people who were far away from him, had no hope, come to know him. Next verse, verse 9. For the fruit of the Spirit is all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. 
and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Don't be silent. There's a whole world out there, whole agenda out there that is being shoved down our throats every day. Don't be silent. Speak up for God. Rather expose the darkness. Verse 12. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. Do you see that? This, this is who you are. This is who you are. We make manifest what is darkness. We make manifest what is hidden. Because you are there. Listen. Evil cannot exist. Must not exist in your presence. Whilst I'm in that office, evil, evil must, you can go about doing stuff, but not in my presence. You have to do it behind me. Verse 14. Therefore he says, Awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Many of us are sleeping. Awake, and Christ will give you. See then, verse 15, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Buying back the time. Because the days are evil, you have to shine that light. Some of us are still waiting for COVID to hit before you start praying. When, when COVID and we were under lockdown, believers were praying all over the world. And I, I remember one time praying, just traveling in the spirit. And the Lord said to me, <laughs> just watch back, don't go back. I'll go back. Life as usual. We have a responsibility. If you are a believer, you have a responsibility. This morning, I want the weight of that responsibility to fall on your shoulders. The weight of the responsibility for the secure, uh, to secure the salvation of your family members. Yes. There are people, that the apostle said, that we have to snatch them from the fire. Don't just assume that, you know, like you just go and you speak the gospel to people and they'll be saved. No, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. There's somebody whose who's job, you know, it's, it's like a, it's, it's like a, like a, a, a slave master. And you are going and you are going to say that, oh, uh, um, I've been sent to, Come and deliver these slaves. You think he's just going to look at you? Read the story of Moses. Pharaoh did not just roll over and say, and say, God, oh, God sent you, the God of Israel. Oh, I'm very sorry. All of them can go. He asked him, who, who is God? Me, me, myself, I'm God. I said, who is God? So if you, you want to see your family members saved, Listen, you, you got to go on your knees. Set an alarm on your phone and pray for salvation and mention their names. And I am telling you, next year, five years by this time, you come give a testimony. Some of you a year, two years, you come share a testimony of how you began to pray for people. And you pray them into the faith. Snap them from the pits of hell. Hallelujah. Finally, some of us are blind. Are blind to the move of God. A spiritual blindness. We are blind to God. We are blind to his presence. And we are blind to his word. One of the dangers of being a child of God Sounds like a contradiction, I know. One of the dangers of being a child of God is you can almost risk being too familiar with the things of God. Those of you who were born in the faith, you know what I'm talking about. You can assume that I know. The Pharisees had this problem. They knew the scriptures 
inside out. They had analyzed these people. Listen, sometimes I, I can actually feel their pain. I, I, can, I can sympathize with them. Imagine for years, from the time they were children, they had been taught the scriptures and they had been groomed to understand that, yes, a Messiah was going to come here. Our deliverer is coming. A king is coming. Now, suddenly, somebody shows up on the scene who is not, he's not like David. He's not fighting battles. He's not fighting Goliath. And yes, he's doing miracles. And he, the way he carries himself is like a king. But it's not like the person we've been told, you've been taught about, you know, we've, we've learned. We've, we are hearing things about him that might seem, but he doesn't really fit the box. So sometimes I can, I can sympathize with them. And, and many, in many ways, for those of us who are, we, when you stay in the faith for a while, that's what can happen to you. I feel like you know, if God is going to move, I know how he's going to move. If God is going to heal, listen, we've, we've seen the move of God before. We've, we've been, we've experienced his power. Listen, I, I know the word of God. I've studied it. And uh, the preacher is, is, is not using the text properly. He's taking some of them out of context. And we know, you know, a spiritual blindness can ensue for that reason. And, and, and our prayer, our posture, the only cure to that is humility. The only cure to that is every time, listen, this, this book, oh my word, is so dynamic and so, every time you pick up this book, go on your knees. And you see I'm saying pick up your book, I'm not saying pick up your phone. There's just something about touching it and feeling it. And it's, it's just a preference, but I'm, I'm teaching you something. There's just something about this. Pick it up. And every time you pick it up, go on your knees. I was so challenged when I, I discovered how um, one of the great, um, like another great theologian of our time, he was talking about how he prepares whenever he's going to study the scriptures. Ah, and I had to start mimicking that. To just go on my knees. Because this is what he was saying. He said, you go on his knees and begin to pray. And say, Lord, open my eyes. And, and begin to repent. And, and, and just that, that posture of humility before God. And say, Lord, I know not. Light up my eyes. Lest I sleep the sleep of death. Psalm 13 verse 3. Then Psalm 119 verse 18 says, Open my eyes, let me behold wondrous things from out of your law. This is an understanding that unless God opens your eyes, you will not see. You cannot see. You have not comprehended the things of God, the, the expanse, the, that dimension of who God is. There is more. How long has your journey been? There is more hunger and thirst for righteousness. Those are, they, those are the ones who are satisfied. Those who hunger there's a, a, there's a hunger and a desperation with which we must approach and come to God daily. Otherwise, we will remain blind. Every time you push us, Lord, I do not know. Lord, I do not see. He said to the Pharisees, now, your problem, and, 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 and look at this very carefully. Do you realize that these people were following Jesus? Not all the Pharisees were in the temple just castigating him. He actually had Pharisees who were following him. Some who come in the night like Nicodemus. Some who, that's why after his death, many of the Pharisees actually came to the faith. Many of them. And, and, and in actual fact, later on it became a problem because some of them were trying to now bring them, take them back to Judaism. Many of the Pharisees were following him. So he said to them, he said, Listen, guys, here's your problem. If you are said that you can't see, your eyes will be open." Your, your sin would have been taken away. But if, because you say you see, your, your sin remains. Your infirmity remains. Every time you take on the posture that I know, you remain in the shadows. You remain grounded. Because God gives grace to the humble. If you, 
when, with, with pride, God himself says he will fight you. So my prayer for all of us, each and every one of us, because I've seen this many times, I, I, I stand accused, I can tell you, I, I, I'm guilty here, where we can analyze certain preachers, we can analyze certain things happening across the body of Christ and make a, a, a final judgment. I'm not saying we should condone any and everything. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that there's a limit to understanding. And many times when we humble ourselves that God opens our eyes to understand and to experience that dimension of his glory and of his miracles. Your prayer must consistently be Jeremiah chapter 33 verse 3. He says, call on me and I will show you great and also mighty things that you do not know. Which means that there are th still things that we don't know. There's, listen, there are things that God wants to show us. There are things that God wants to teach us. In his word. And it's not just for you to listen, but it's that there comes a time where you yourself, you become an instructor. Paul had been preaching for long and he said, by this time, many of you ought to be teachers. Many of you ought to be evangelists. Many of you ought to be pastors. It comes to a time where you shift from that, from that place of just hearing to ministering. Every believer a minister. That's every nation church, hear me. Our interest is not to gather people to come warm the seats. No. It's to empower. It's to train. It's to equip is to send people on mission. Just like Jesus sent that man to the pool called Saint. Because he's saying to him, once I open your eyes, you're on mission. I commission you. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, what? Go. Don't sit down. So today, as we leave this place, go to your family. Go to your office. Go into that community. Proclaim that Jesus is Lord. There's more in Jesus. Let me end with this. There's so much in him. Don't just stay with the previous revelation. Anything that you've experienced, even John 3.16. Go to, yes, John 3.16. Today when you go back, the Lord open my eyes again, John 3.16. And you discover it afresh. Because there's progressive revelation the deity of Jesus Christ. And that's what you see in this man. In the verse 11, when he came to him, uh, when he went to go report about Jesus, he said, the man by name Jesus, he's the one who spat and sent me to the pool. Right? So he called him, at that point, he called him Jesus. Yeah? Later on, he referred to him as, the Pharisees asked him, who do you say he is? Because he healed you. He said he's a prophet. Watch. He calls him Jesus. That's like a man. Eh? A man by name Jesus. Then he calls him prophet. But the most important revelation that you and I have to bring to the world in this day and age, in the verse 38, he said, Lord, who is this Lord that I may worship? And Jesus said to him, the one who stands before you, he is. And he called him what? Lord, I believe. Someone say, Lord, I believe. This must be the end point of all men. Of all your family members, of all your friends. Lord, I believe. It's called progressive revelation. When we were studying John chapter 4, you see that also. The woman at the, at the well. She started by calling him. A teacher or, or man. She, she was just referring to him as a man. Then later on, as he begins to drop revelations, she calls him a prophet. Then later on, she goes into the town and calls to, his, calls to him and says, could, he be, could this be the Messiah? You see, that progressive revelation. All of us must have. I say, I say to you, and I've said it before, don't stay with Jesus in the, in the manger. Many of us, the, the concept of Jesus that we have is Christmas. Jesus, gentle Jesus, make him out in the manger. He, didn't, he is not in the manger. And he's not even in the grave. 
He's not on the cross. Where is he? Seated at the right hand of God. He's seated in the heavenly realms and we are seated with him. So don't stay with the image of Jesus that you have. Grow. May your eyes be open to experience and to see him like you never have. Jesus is the one who heals physical blindness. He heals spiritual blindness. And he heals us even when we are lost. We don't track, we don't see the move of God. We don't understand the word of God. We can't comprehend the things of God. That's a blindness that only Jesus can heal. Rise up on your feet, let's pray. Because your name is a light that the shadows can't deny. Your name cannot be overcome. Lord, your name is a life forever lifted high. Your name cannot be overcome. Lord, your name is a light that the shadows can't deny. Your name cannot be overcome. Jesus, your name, it is a life. It's forever lifted high. Your name cannot be overcome. Lord, your name is a light that the shadows can deny. Your name cannot be overcome. Lord, your name is a light that forever lives with Your name cannot. Who can stand against the Lord? Who can stand against the Lord? Who can stand against the Lord? That is powerful and big, that is mightier than the name Jesus. Your name.